Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone. Welcome. 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 One of the hopefully not one of the few, but a nice night uh, to, mark, to mark the event is called Re um, Revolution in Halifax, Halifax and Revolution. It's really an event to mark, to, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the historic Black Family Mass Democratic Meeting that took place on November 30th, 1968, in this very location. So it's really uh, uh, you know, a unique privilege, it's really, uh, shall we say, quite powerful and poignant to actually mark an event, not only 50 years to the day that it took place and the evening that it took place, but in the actual physical location. Now, I understand the actual meeting took place in the basement, but it's important to understand that over 500 African Nova Scotians uh, participated in the meeting. And I, I, and I think it's that was critical. So the way the event is going to proceed, uh, L. Jones has written a special poem for the occasion. Uh, I will be then followed by me giving a, sort of a, a 15 minute, 20 minute contextualization of 1968, this is a very incredible year. Uh, Lynn Jones is going to facilitate discussion, uh, and one of the I've got a number of regrets when they first uh, when a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago when, when the event was organised and the Facebook post went up, there are a number of people who had participated uh, at that meeting and particularly in the early years of the Black United Front who said they were going to be able to make it, but but some of them. Uh, I, uh, some of them have just sent me regrets and so forth. Uh, Joan Jones, who was, um, and it's important to understand that quite often when the history of the civil rights movement, the black liberation struggle, the black power movement, whichever terminology you wish to use, quite often when it's written, women are, are excluded from the story. They're written out of the story, even though they played critical roles. And this is one thing we have to be very mindful of. Uh, Joan Jones, who played a very important role in bringing Rocky in, in, in the political conscientization of, of uh, Rocky Jones, who plays a key, who's a key figure in the event itself uh, of the Black Family Meeting, uh, she was going to be here today, but she has um, come down with a very bad case of the flu. I had lengthy discussions with her a couple of days ago, and a lengthy discussion uh, uh, tonight, and so she won't be want to be here. So I've been forced sort of to uh, improvise. I'm hoping that people will participate uh, from um, the crowd. Lynn Jones will facilitate. Uh, Susie uh, Google, who um, uh, has been extremely important in terms of fighting for the rights of African Nova, Nova Scotian learners, will sit on the panel. Okay, Lynn will facilitate. Uh, L. Jones, who is a well-known activist on prison rights, will be here as well. And I will sit in one of the stairs, chairs and hopefully be quiet. Okay. <laughs> but I think it's important. I didn't want this event. I'm on parental leave. Uh, and I didn't want this event to go unnoticed, unremarked on, because it's such a historic event. And I think it was important to at least have some sort of commemoration of that event. Uh, before we proceed uh, to what I think is going to be an incredibly powerful poem from L. Jones, um, it's important uh, it's, you've been, you've been sitting here or coming in and receiving leaflets advertising um, a fight for a racism free Halifax transit. Uh, some of you are probably aware of what happened to me and my beautiful baby Asha on a bus on October 25th. And so we've launched a campaign uh, because we saw this as an opportunity to do this uh, simply because it's a strategic space. It's a mode of transportation that's indispensable for so many people from the African Nova Scotian community, so many people who are immigrants, so many people, for example, who don't have the economic wherewithal to buy a car and therefore forego public transit. And so we saw this as an opportunity to challenge this because so many racist incidents have taken place. And this opportunity, I think, is hopefully bearing fruit. Uh, to give an update on what has happened, uh, uh, one of the persons who engaged in that racist attack on me and my beautiful baby Asha was today uh, charged and arrested and <laughs> I think that has a lot to do with the publicity that came out of that case and also sort of the differential treatment that I someone who teaches at university received. So we said, why should people receive differential treatment? Uh, those acts are egregious uh, regardless of who those acts are directed against. So we're fighting to, uh, fighting to basically, um, in a sense, win at least some positive and progressive gains in a strategic public space, which is transit. We also have buttons uh, uh, that are available if people want the buttons. Larry Haven, who played a central role in organizing um, uh, this group of concerned Hal Haligonians 
um, has buttons there, there's a leaflet, you can join our campaign. We're going to be launching, uh, for example, uh, we're going to have uh, three ads run on the coast, and, and we're going to, the goal is to collect stories. So when we go to Halifax, when we go to um, the municipality, we can say, here is the objective basis, here is the evidentiary basis. You all know, quite often we have to prove again that racism exists. So once again, we have to go through that process, but we're focusing on the strategic space. So, I, so Jack, so I'm very happy that we won uh, that victory. That is a small victory. So without any further ado, L. Jones. Do you need the mic, L? Yes. Good evening, peace, everybody. Say peace back to you. Peace. Poems kind of epically long. Just saying. <laughs> Is the revolution dead? Did it die when Malcolm took 16 shots, or did it hang on until Martin saw the mountaintop? Did it stop with Cabral of Phnom? Did it drop with the Viet Cong, or was it when the CIA buried Lumumba's body in the bush? Did it hush when the police gunned down Fred Hampton, or was it crushed when Biko was gone? Is the revolution done? Did we help its death along when we donned kinte strips while watching our mining companies strip the wealth from Africa? Was it swan song when we cheered Mandela out of prison only to watch the ANC steal billions while the whites kept all the banks? Was that our thanks for the tanks rolling over the bodies of our youth? Were we soothed with promises of integration while they called us criminals on the news? Was it stunned? When Canadian troops marched into Haiti, or maybe it expired quietly while we were having fun at a gala or a barbecue. Is the revolution through? Are we just palms? Was it all a big con as we watched those who marched with King take commerce jobs and vote for the war in Iraq? Did it crack when representatives who share our skin voted for three strike laws and to strip welfare away from our kin, calling them super predators? Did its death throes begin when Cosby got away with telling young black men not to steal pound cake while slipping drugs into women's drinks? Did it blink its last while we swallowed respectability politics pretending that it would fix white supremacy if we just acted wide enough? Did we throw it under the bus when we watched them chuck our cousins into prisons and stick community police offices on the corner of our communities without ever throwing a brick? Did it kick or did it die without a fuss? When we let Obama send drones over us and deport children back to war zones while we were struck dumb, admiring Michelle on the cover of Vogue? Or do we think it died closer to home? Had the revolution flown when folks went to the government for funding to stop the radicals from organizing buff? Was its life snuffed out for the price of a house in the South End until all we had left to offer the youth was a couple of days in February and some drums? Did white teachers call the police to take the revolution out of school in handcuffs? Did the end come when they closed our schools without a sit-in? Was it the first time we agreed to Ben telling ourselves we can work from within the system? Did the oppressive forces win when they sent bulldozers into Africville? Did the revolution die on Parliament Hill? Did we sell the revolution out in return for a few bills? Or was it killed when they manipulated us to turn on our own? Did the revolution pass? with Rocky Jones? Did the revolution phone in sick because it was too cold that day to hit the streets in protest? Was the revolution just too embarrassing to support in front of white co-workers, so we let them throw sticks and stones while leaving our fighters out there alone? Did the revolution groan while we were busy with gossip? Did we call the revolution crazy and militant and try to clip its wings? Did we forget the revolution while we were singing hymns? Did we lead the revolution to the crypt? Was the revolution watching Netflix? Or did we mix its blood and leave its children to be raised by white mothers? Did we pick allegiance with the temporary comforts of white supremacy over the struggle? Did the revolution slip from our grip when we called black women tricks and let bitch stay on our lips deciding that black women were just too troublesome for relationships? Was it when black men decided to exit their responsibilities and we let them blame the single moms who stayed? Was the revolution slave when they made us dependent on assistance and sent workers into our homes to survey our living conditions? Did they break our resistance when they convinced us to value each other on the basis of shade? Was the revolution played out for a check? Did we wreck the revolution for a few Grammys? Or was it when Bush pinned a medal on the chest of Muhammad Ali? Did we sell the revolution's goals for a Super Bowl and afford a few more black faces on TV? 
how we let the revolution be stolen by Nike and fashion companies is the revolution taking a knee while we put money into the pockets of white billionaires who run our industries. Did we trade the revolution for a kinder, gentler slavery? <clears throat> Was it self-hate that made the revolution die? Was the revolution betrayed by our own kind? Did the revolution hide while we forgot our history? Was it suicide or homicide? Did it retire while we relied on politicians to fight for our interests instead of taking a stand? Maybe it died when we started cracking a few thousand grand, or maybe it expired at the hands of government grants Did we walk its coffin right up to the man as long as he sit, let us sit at the table and lick up his crumbs. Has the revolution run its course? Did we replace its force with weapons because we neglected to give our young men pride or a way out of poverty? Did it die on the streets? Did the revolution lose its teeth when the drug money flowed in and we started laying wreaths on the graves of young men? Did the revolution end? Or does the revolution live again? Did we feel its heartbeat when Zimmerman murdered Trayvon? Was the revolution strong when they hit the streets in Ferguson after Wilson gunned down Mike Brown? Was the revolution found when we occupied police headquarters in Toronto? Is the revolution idle, or is it written in the land titles of the families fighting for land in North Preston? Is the revolution asking questions about police profiling? Is the revolution done suggesting and has started wilding? And is the revolution thriving in the breasts of the municipal workers and the janitors protesting racism? Is it climbing out of the garbage dumps and landfills infesting the graves of our ancestors? Is the revolution shining in the faces of the youth wearing Black Lives Matter tees? And is it smiling on the teachers expanding their minds in schools and universities? Is the revolution finding its feet in the 48 black communities when the revolution is not afraid to speak? Does the revolution freeze outside for a $15 minimum wage? And do we find the revolution locked in a cage? Did the revolution like the prison strike? And is the revolution on the mic at rallies and hip hop shows and poetry readings? Is the revolution still breathing? Are we leading the revolution in demands for reparations? The revolution is done with patience. The revolution is raging for us all over the Pan-African nation. The revolution is fighting deportations and marching on the prisons and police stations and calling down the education system and resisting gentrification. But the revolution isn't waiting. So if you're sitting here shaking, Afraid of what the white man might be saying? If you're scared of the revolution we're making in this room, that's okay because the revolution isn't fading. And a new day is breaking because the revolution is in me. And the revolution is you. Because the revolution never died. It resides in our bones and rushes with the blood in our veins and beats in our hearts. It breathes in our communities when we collectively do our part. The revolution lives when black people come together wherever we are. So raise up your fist, plant your feet, and let the revolution start. feels like everything's been said. <laughs> I didn't give Ella a proper introduction. I was remiss, but you know, she never needs one. Her power of her poetry, the power of her advocacy on prison issues, I think um, is equal by none. So thank you, Ella, for that incredible uh, powerful poem, and I hope it will be published and disseminated because I think it captures the spirit of, of what we're here, we're gathered here today to discuss. So I want to provide sort of historical context for this meeting that took place in Halifax on November 30th in 1968. The 1960s, especially 1968, was a time of rebellion across the world, with the global black liberation struggle constituting a crucial part of these revolutionary upheavals. In many ways, the 1960s was a high point of liberation struggles and the anti-imperialist movement around the world, especially among youth and students. Across the world, country after country, in Africa, Asia, and Latin America are throwing off or in the midst of struggles to throw off the colonial and imperial yoke. However, many of these struggles aim to go beyond the mere achievement of formal independence, but also aspire to radically transform their societies. An apex of these revolutionary aspirations was the 1966 revolutionary gathering in Cuba. From January 3rd to January 15th in Havana, 512 delegates and 270 observers and guests from anti-imperialist and revolutionary organizations from 82 countries gathered in the Solidarity Conference of the Peoples of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, 
this is more widely known as the Tricontinental Conference. They gathered to discuss and debate anti-imperialist and anti-neocolonial theory, practice, and strategy. Their object, nothing less than to unite third world struggles for national liberation and social emancipation. The Moroccan socialist leader, Mehdi Ben Barker, the principal art architect and organizer of the Tricontinental, explicitly articulated that the meeting's revolutionary objective was to, quote, blend the two great currents of, of world revolution, that which was born in 1917 in the Russian Revolution, and that which represents the anti-imperialist and national liberation movements of today. In the United States, after years of mass protests throughout the country, especially in the southern states, civil rights acts were finally passed in 1964 and 1965, and the movement against the Vietnam War became a mass movement. The same radicalization also swept through the United States with visions of remaking the very substance of the country. This gripped people's imaginations. Radical organizations, many claiming to be Marxist, Leninist, or at least oriented to socialism, proliferated. Within, the context, within this context, the African-American struggle for equal rights gave way to the fight for black liberation. In 1966, for example, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense was founded by Huey Newton. And, uh, no, I'm drawing my and Bobby Sears, yeah. okay, in, in Oakland, California, explicitly aimed at achieving black self-determination by revolutionary means. While the Black Panthers are the most well-known and perhaps most influential, other rad radical black organizations also emerged. For example, the Republic of New Africa uh, and the Revolutionary League of Black Workers, just to mention two. The 1960s was a time when many thought a new and better and more just world was not only possible but imminent, just around the corner. This hope, expectation, was matched by, the, by trepidation and frantic anxiety of ruling circles, especially within Western imperialism. For example, the Tricontinental Conference was cast by Western intelligence an analysts as an existential threat that presaged and initiated a global assault on Western imperialism, opening, and I'm quoting from, these, from official documents, an era of international guerrilla warfare. To neutralize these threats, the West unleashed a concerted global campaign of subversion and assassination orchestrated by Washington uh, that targeted national liberation movements, particularly its leadership. For example, on October 29, 1965, Mehdi Barker, uh, Ben Barker, the intellectual author of the Tricontinental Conference, was kidnapped in Paris, never to be seen again. There seemed little doubt that this was a joint operation of agents of the Moroccan government, French police, with the collusion and participation of the United States Central Intelligence Agency. It is also not inconsequential that the Tricontinental Conference was preceded by the overthrow of Indonesian President uh, Sukarno in 1965, which set in motion the mass killing of hundreds of thousands of suspected communists. And of course, we have the assassination in 1967 of the legendary revolutionary Ernesto Che Guevara. These are but a few examples of the West's intense response to the burgeoning Third World Revolution. This violent international reaction was mirrored in the United States. Within the United States, the Black Liberation Movement was especially singled out for repression. Many prominent individuals, either associated with civil rights or actual organizers, were assassinated, from Malcolm X to Martin Luther King to Fred Hampton. The FBI declared that the Black Panthers constituted the greatest single internal security threat to the United States. Consequently, the Black Panther Party, which had established several um, health care centers and school breakfast programs in African-American communities, surely a tremendous threat to imperialism, were targeted by the government for destruction through an FBI code name a uh, program called the Counterintelligence Insurgency Program, in short, COINTEL, or we know it by its acronym. With many of its leaders, such as the previously mentioned Fred Hampton and numerous others, eventually being assassinated. Indeed, the FBI was determined, and this is a direct quote from the FBI's documents, prevent the rise of a messiah who would unify and electrify the militant black nationalist movement, and prevent the coalition of militant black nationalist groups in unity, their strength, a truism that is no less valid for all its tightness. An effective coalition of black nationalist groups might be the first step towards a real mamo, referring to the Kenyan national liberation struggle that took place by the Kikuyu, the beginning, and I'm quoting it, of a true black revolution, end of quote. This is the context in which 1968, in which this historic meeting in Halifax took place, this is the context in which it, in 1968 is embedded. As Assad Haider, author of Mistaken Identity, Racing Class in the Age of Trump, notes, the 1960s was, quote, a time when the struggles against racism, capitalism, and imperialism converged on a global scale and advanced a project for liberation, end of quote. Yes, the 60s was a turbulent decade, but it's a decade in which the vision of a world centered on justice, peace, internationalism, and human dignity seemed within grasp. And in this decade, 
1968 stands out as a watershed year, the iconic year of an iconic decade, the apogee of this turbulence and hope, the year of revolution, the year of global revolt. For example, in 1968, was, uh, uh, this year was ushered in by the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, which demonstrated the inability of US imperialism to defeat the heroic people of Vietnam. In May, in France, the general strike and student movement brought down the government of Charles de Gaulle in France, and for a time, France seemed on the verge of revolution. In Mexico, students protested um, at the enormous funds spent on the 1968 Olympics, while there was no, so much poverty and inequality in the country. And then, they were massacred in the hundreds by the Mexican army. And of course, in the 1968 Olympics, and I actually have the, the image here, but I won't show it, uh, we have the famous powerful Black Power Salute protest against racism, racism by the US athletes John Carlos and Tommy Smith. In 1968, the Cuban Revolutionary Government launched the anti-capitalist offensive in an effort to accelerate from capitalism past the stage of socialist construction uh, to a moneyless economy, directly, therefore, trying to establish uh, the a communist society. In Dhaka, Senegal, students and then workers began protesting high unemployment and foreign economic domination. In South Africa, under the leadership of Steve Bantu Biko, the Black Consciousness Organization, the South African <coughs> Students' Organization was founded. And also in 68, as many of you know, we witnessed the invasion of Czechoslovakia, the overthrow of the Pakistan government, the Biafran civil war in Nigeria, and the, and the Rodney riots in Jamaica. There was this conference in Montreal, which I'll talk about later, where Walter Rodney went to and, went, and was barred from coming back into Jamaica. He was from Guyana. He's one of the great historians. And uh, the, because he was so respected by the youth and by the poor, they rioted when the uh, Jamaican government wouldn't allow him back into Jamaica. In the United States, on April 4th, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated while leading a strike of Memphis sanitation workers. He was in the midst of building the Poor People's Campaign, a multiracial army of the poor, as he described it to march in Washington. As King deepened his critique of capitalism and imperialism, he called for, quote, radical changes in the structure of our society to redistribute wealth and power. He maintained that civil rights law were empty without human rights, including economic rights. In the wake of, his, of King's assassination, riots and uprisings broke out in over 60 American cities, wherever it was said that King had set foot. Quite often, the 1960s, and in particular the black liberation struggle, is presented as having occurred completely outside of Canada. Now, just as if, I know it's interesting as well, sort of an attack, just as slavery is portrayed and racism are portrayed as things that exist outside of Canada in the so called neighborhood of the South. Nevertheless, despite this characterization, in Canada, thousand state sittings at US consulates in protest against racial discrimination, the war in Vietnam, and the growth of American domination of Canada itself. A number of radical organizations, too numerous for me to mention, just as I couldn't mention all these organizations in the case of the United States, were formed. The Internationalists, the Canadian Liberation Movement, on loot, and others. The revolutionary fervor of black liberation also encompassed and embraced Canada. Halifax, Montreal, and Toronto, along with the sometimes referred to as the Canada-US borderland, were part of the revolutionary wave of the 1960s. In 1968, uh, Lenny Johnson, the first African Canadian to join the Communist Party of Canada, founded with his right when the legendary Third World Books and Crafts, which for three decades what became a central, if not the central, intellectual hub for black activists in Toronto. And many of us probably remember going to Third World Bookstore. It used to be on Bathurst Street, you know, get off the Bathurst subway station, you take a right, and there was this incredible cornucopia, this oasis of black radical literature and discussion that took place. Okay. It also was the headquarters of, for the Afro-American Progressive Association, Canada's first black power organization, which also was founded in 1916. It should be noted that the term Afro-American referred to all those of African descent in the Americas, not just to people from the United States. A key figure in this organization, some of you may know, who is legendary in Toronto, was Otis Richmond, a good friend of mine, who at 21 had taken up residence in Toronto in opposition to the Vietnam War and his induction into the Vietnam draft. In Montreal, a number of Caribbean students and immigrants formed the core of radical activists, study groups, and activities. The most powerful manifestation of this activism, this, the, the thinking they were doing in the study groups, was the Black Writers Congress hosted in Montreal from October 11 to 14, 1968, in which major black revolutionary figures and intellectuals in North America participated and spoke. For example, Stokely Carmichael, Walter Rodney, James Foreman, and Nova Scotia's own Burnley Rocky Jones. And Rocky talks about it 
His book is available back there uh, among, the, books, uh, among uh, the book tables. And a new book has just recently come out, just a couple weeks ago, Moving Against the System, the 1968 Congress of Black Writers and the Making of Global Consciousness by David Austin. And the photos that are included in this, uh, and you see one of them down there in the, uh, in the corner there, Rocky, you see uh, James is talking to Michael. Uh, all the photos that exist at that Black Writers Congress were from Rocky. So Nova Scotia, uh, Nova Scotia was part of that powerful global upsurge in 1960. The mass democratic gathering, the black family meeting that took place here, whose 50th anniversary we are marking this evening, in many ways was a direct consequence of the Black Writers' Congress. Bernie and Rocky Jones, who participated in the Black Writers' Congress in Montreal, was a central figure among others, okay? But he was a central figure in the organization of the black family meeting. Rocky served as an active conduit for and mediator of those revolutionary ideas. And his autobiography is a tremendous read, and if you're reading anything about the civil rights movement in Canada or the United States, I always recommend read the memoir by Stokely Carmichael, Ready for Revolution, and also read Rocky side by side. Rocky does for Canada what Stokely, for the struggle in Canada, what Stokely Carmichael did for the struggle in the United States. I'm not saying they're perfect memoirs, but they're the best memoirs to actually have come out of that era. After the Black Righteous Congress, which was, um, which was held in Montreal, Stokely Carmichael came to Halifax for a short visit. And some people may rely, uh, remember he actually came here for rest and, rest and relaxation, and that didn't happen. So while he came for some rest and relaxation, it was right from his frenetic schedule. I mean, the story is kind of funny. Rocky meets him because Rocky had left Toronto, gone to Toronto, became radicalized in Toronto, was working with SNCC, other black liberation movements, raising funds. And when he was at the Black Writers Congress, Stokely was looking for a break, some rest and relaxation. So Rocky says, come, we'll chill out in Halifax. Everything will be calm. So Rocky arrives in Halifax, makes the preparations. And when it's time to go and pick up uh, Stokely at the airport, he talks to his friend James Walker, who is a you know, uh, professor of history at Waterloo. And he says, listen, we all know the RCMP and the police are falling. So why don't I take your car, and you take my car, and you drive around in my car, they'll be falling all day, and I can just take your car, pick up Stokely, nobody will know, and we can proceed in um, calm and tranquility. Now what actually happens is obviously the police were watching Rocky, and they saw when he switched cars. <laughs> so what happens is everybody knew Stokely Carmichael was there. Okay. And so his resting relaxation didn't take place. But why? Um, uh, while he was seeking respite, and there was a tremendous amount of coverage, frenetic coverage of his activity here, Carmichael also had discussions about the problems and issues facing the African Nova Scotian community. And, uh, and locating the black struggle in this province within the glo global, global black liberation movement. Carmichael declared, and I quote, We are internationalizing black power. We recognize all the problems that black people of Halifax have, and we want to begin some coordination so we can move against racism and capitalism. That was an interview he gave to one of the uh, media. In summing up Stokely Carmichael's visit, one person pointedly observed, and I quote, a great many people are upset about Stokely Carmichael's visit to Halifax last month. As far as, I, as far as I'm concerned, if they're upset enough to do something about some of the conditions here, then Stokely Carmichael ought to come to visit Halifax every weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I must admit that I am upset too. I'm upset about the things that Stokely Carmichael must have seen while here. Bad housing. Lack of recreation space, Negroes looking for work and a future to no avail, welfare institutions that perpetuate poverty, Negroes who lack information about their rights, and a human rights organization that has no teeth. This is the reality that we have to face. And perhaps some would say the reality we have to face in 2018. Before he left Halifax, Carmichael, who at the time was part of the leadership of the Black Panther Party, committed to sending a group of Black Panthers to Halifax to assist the community in organizing to confront its oppression and exploitation. Indeed, the catalyst for the Black Family Meeting was this contingent uh, from the Black Panther Party. Eight in total, names such as D.D. D. Pauli, Norman Cook, and the notorious George Sams might be familiar to many of you. And some of you may have actually met them, right? Uh, and um, I had a long conversation at a conference in, in April and 68, in, this, uh, in April of this year, in um, at Binghamton University in New York, and I sat down with Norman Cook, who was here, and we had a long conversation. I'm hoping he's going to write his memoirs and write about his, his visit here as well. Uh, George Sams was notorious, and we can actually follow that <coughs> man. He was apparently at six or seven bullet holes, and as, uh, and actually liked to show them off and loved to play loud music, as John Jones was telling me, because they all stayed in uh, in Rocky's house, around Rocky's house and so on. The, ar the arrival of the Panthers caused a great deal of anxiety and trepidation in some circles. A local newspaper commented, quote, 
The appearance on the scene of the Black Power Advocates totally came out last October, followed by the representatives of the Black Panther group in the United States indicated that the militant group was on the increase. The presence of these well-known militants caused precipitable jitters. That's actual quote. That's what the actual is. Precipitable jitters throughout the province, as if it's a good thing. Jitters which indicated a guilty conscience of the part on the part of whites. If they had treated black people properly, they would have no cause for alarm. Indeed, the U.S. militants would not have bothered to come to Halifax. End of quote. It bears underscoring that the Panthers quite patiently traveled from community to community, participating in the sober analysis and assessment of the conditions and challenges facing African Nova Scotians. It was the Panther stats that the circumstances when black Nova, in which the black Nova Scotian struggle was taking place were different than in the United States. And therefore, black Nova Scotians would have to create strategies and instruments of struggle commensurate with their situation. While the idea of holding a black family mass democratic meeting came from the Panthers, it's important to understand that while that was a catalyst, okay, the material conditions that made such a meeting perhaps inevitable was the frustration growing among youth over the glacial pace of change and seeming impotence, reluctance of the then black leadership in, in preventing the dispossession and forced resettlement of the residents of Africa that took place from 68 to 1970, and the inability to address the manifold social problems that afflicted African Nova Scotia. One key statistic from that period, this is one key statistic I believe, um, is that in 1969, only 3% of black students, African Nova Scotian students, graduated from high school, and only 1% of the graduates attended universities, i.e. 0.03% of black students. And there's a, there's a number of reports. One was done by the Rev, Dr. Re, uh, Reverend, Dr. Uh, Re, uh, Dr. Reverend uh, P. Oliver that uh, focused on this, and a couple of other studies. The mass, black, black political meeting, the mass black political meeting held on November 30, 1968, here, in which more than 500 African Nova Scotians packed the Halifax North Branch Memorial Library was perhaps the most important political gathering of the provincial black community. Key figures and lesson, lesson, lesson known community activists gathered to discuss the community's problems and challenges and to establish a framework to realize, realize African Nova Scotian self-determination. Euphoria gripped the participants. Frank Boyd, who was at that meeting, observed, quote, the glow of black power was within us, never in our homes, Never in our churches or public meeting spaces, never on festive occasions, but it did happen in a facility owned and operated by the city of Halifax. And one of the issues was it was a black only meeting, which frightened many people in Halifax. As David Austin observes in his recently published Moving Against the System, the 1968 Congress of Black Writers and the Making of Global Consciousness, this elation encapsulated and reflected that quote. Black politics in the 1960s represented a struggle by people of African descent to realize their full humanity within the constraints of anti-black racism and economic imperialism. It was a public exorcism, the releasing of centuries of pent-up anger, anxiety, and frustration, and it attempted to abandon the demons that slavery and colonization had invested in their minds and bodies." End of quote. This historic meeting that was held 50 years ago in this very building was the first clearly articulated political expression of African Nova Scotian nation. While the September 1st, 1854 founding of the African United Baptist Association was the first organizational expression of the idea of African Nova Scotian nationhood, the historic black family meeting of November 30, 1968 represents the first conscious political articulation of the historical black Nova Scotian community. As a distinct people, a distinctiveness forged through their long sojourn in Nova Scotia. Moreover, this African Nova Scotian assertion of nationhood and aspiration for self-determination reflected the late 1960s and 1970s revival of black nationalism and pan-Africanism in the United States. It was part and parcel of an emerging revolutionary uh, global black re emerging black revolutionary global consciousness. A direct consequence of the meeting was the creation of a pan-provincial organization in the Black United Front. <coughs> The discussion of what decisions were made at that meeting and what the actual decision was has been much debated. Was the decision really made to constitute a Black United Front and a steering committee at that time? Or was the decision made to actually establish a committee that would then look into what organization needed to be set up to represent the interests of African Nova Scotians? how that organization was going to be set up, and then report back to another mass democratic meeting. Mm -hmm. That is the position of Rocky Jones, that is the position of Frank Boyd. But nevertheless, what emerges is the interim committee that was elected then becomes the first committee 
that leads Black United Front. And we can get into a further discussion of how some radicals like Rocky Jones suddenly get squeezed out of the Black United Front. But what's interesting is that the BUS mission statement declared that its goal was to achieve, quote, a level of self-determination for the African Nova Scotian community. However, given what I've just said, as you all know, there can be quite different and irreconcilable definitions and understandings of what actually constitutes self-determination and how that self-determination should be achieved. I will return to this theme and buff at the end of my remarks. We have ample evidence of how the visit of the Black Panthers, the Black Family Meeting, and the creation of Buff transformed the political and cultural consciousness of Black Nova Scotians. The impact was almost immediate. For example, in 1969, the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission was created as a direct response of the Nova Scotian government to counteract the growing radicalism within the Black community. In 1969, the Black Educators Association is founded. 1970, the Transition Year Program was established. And actually, one was also established not only at Dalhousie, but also at the University of Toronto. In Halifax, mass demonstrations and marches were held on African Liberation Day, which is May the 25th for several years. For example, in 1973, a group, a march of about 200 people to Citadel Hill, led by Rocky Jones, symbolically renamed it Maroon Hill. And it should still be renamed Maroon Hill, I would argue. In 1977, the residents of North Preston, East Preston, Cherrybrook, Lake Luna, Lake Major united and defeated an attempt by the Halifax County to seize community land around Lake Loon under the pretext of protecting the water supply of Dartmouth. Echoes of Africa, obviously. In the literary field, in what is often termed the Black Nova Scotia Renaissance, several poets, writers, and actors emerged from the 70s and 80s, notably George Eliot Clark, Maxine Tyne, David Woods, Henry Bishop, George Boyd, and Walter Borden. In the field of music and performing arts, various troops were formed, including For the Moment, uh, Voices, the Gospel Ears, and Nova Scotia Mass Squad. In the world of Film, video, and TV. The 1978 series Black Insights, six episodes in history, education, employment, land claims, community, and church. A very good series, made in 1978, and it's available if you go to the Central Library, you can actually look at it. And I actually managed to get all the copies, uh, copies of them transferred to the Halifax, to the Killam Library in Dalhousie University. It was, was followed by two one one award winning films produced by Sylvia Hamilton, Black Mother, Black Daughter, Speaking from, and Speaking from the Heart of Black Nova Scotia, and other things as well. I'm just giving you as a brief uh, synopsis of some of the things that took place. In journalism, George A. Clark and Charles Sanders published The Rap from 1980 to 1985. And we have the formation in 1980 of the African Genealogy Society to preserve the memory of Africville, advocate for equitable composition for former residents, and they've also organized the annual reunions that take place in Africville. And of course, in 1983, one of the most vibrant organizations to take shape was the Cultural Awareness Youth Group. Um, it developed branches in schools throughout the metro area dedicated to highlighting black history and culture. And we have, the, uh, we have the, um, the opening of the Black Cultural Center in 1983 in Dartmouth to defend the culture and identity of the community. However, despite these positive achievements, significant racial inequality and socioeconomic marginalization persist. For example, in 2011, according to the National Housing Survey, 34.8% of African Nova Scotians lived in low-income families as opposed to 16.5% for Nova Scotia as well. I mean, the poverty rate for African Nova Scotians is more than twice the rate for white, for white, twice the rate for white Nova Scotians. In comparison, the average income for Nova Scotians was over $42,000, while, uh, while for blacks, it was just over $29,000. The 2017 United Nations report of the working group of experts on the people of African descent on its mission to Canada while acknowledging African Nova Scotians have, quote, developed a distinct culture, traditions, and social and political practices, this report also highlighted the existence of ongoing systemic racism, which continues to reproduce a society in which, and I'm quoting directly from the report, the educational inequities between African Nova Scotians and other Nova Scotians have remained unchanged after 30 years of school integration. The socioeconomic conditions in the black communities across the province remain deplorable. The socioeconomic conditions of the African of black communities across the province remain, remain deplorable. African Nova Scotians' ability to access post-secondary education, especially professional schools, remains very limited. Reflecting on what has changed or not changed in the 50 years that have flashed by since the historic November 30, 1968 meeting, necessitates us evaluating the political trajectory of the Black United Front, which lasted until 1995, when due to government funding, it was forced to close its doors. While Buff was a crucial development for the African Nova Scotian community, its history in many ways is emblematic of the role of the state in co-opting and neutralizing revolutionary militant initiatives. And a prisoner of Buff, and a prisoner of Buff in my opinion, starkly poses two key questions. What is the relationship and what should be the relationship between African Nova Scotian organizations and the Canadian state? That is a key question I think we have to answer. 
despite the increasing, despite the increase, the mushroom ring, some would say, of black organizations, despite greater African Nova Scotian presence in state institutions, in the so-called corridors of power, disenfranchisement, unemployment, disproportionate rates of incarceration, and everything from racial profiling and a whole slew of other social economic issues, um, issues and ills still plague the community. In summing up the Buff experience, Rocky Jones noted, and I quote from him, and it's an extensive quote, the Black United Front began with such hope and idealism, but it went down the path of government dependency and eventually disappeared. Because it had long outlived its values to the community, if we want to address the social issues facing our community and our young people today, we have to construct organizations that are really in the hands of the people and dedicated to the interests of the people. If you don't seize and hold power, then the long-term transformation of the social problem is timely. From a historical point of view, the message is that you need wholesale change, fundamental structural change. Messing around with partial reforms won't do anything except delay the solution. This is the critical lesson, I would say, of my lifetime as a community activist. As the saying goes, freedom is a constant struggle. Your presence here this evening is evidence that the yearning for freedom and self-determination is not defeated nor dead. That the idea and mission of the historic black family mass and democratic me me meeting still retain relevancy and urgency. Thank you. give us the historical context of the person that was actually there at that famous uh, meeting in this place in that time. So that's why we're just shifting a little bit to make things as, as powerful as we can for you. I want to take this opportunity, first and foremost, because I think it's always great, to welcome a Sister Shauna Paris Hoyt back home. You can give her a round of applause. Anybody? No. And I do that because I remember when um, I only spent one year in my life away from uh, Nova Scotia doing some trade union uh, uh, work. And I can still remember, and that's got to be when I came back, it's at least uh, maybe around 20 years ago or something when I went away, I can still remember the day that I came back, attended a meeting where there were a lot, mostly people of color, but others, and they came and they hugged me and they kissed me and they put their arms around me, and I thought, yeah, I'm home. <laughs> so if you see Shauna, give her hugs, kisses, and 
and let her know her presence was truly missed in this our place. That's what they call the social program. Um, what, um, what I had hoped to do, we lost power uh, yesterday, and me who's not technically savvy, um, was uh, over at, any of you that know, have, know that uh, about the archives at St. Mary's University, uh, the Lynn Jones African Canadian and Diaspora uh, uh, collection, heritage collection, where I have collected um, newspaper articles, periodicals, and different things on the history that has happened in black Nova Scotia mainly, but also Aboriginal um, Nova Scotia. So actually it was started even before the establishment of Buff as a uh, young girl. So I had hoped to go through all the archives. We did have one of the students that uh, did go through the archives and pull out all the information about the Black United Front, what was in the newspaper at the time. And um, her not knowing my technical uh, ability, sent it in some kind of zip kind of file that could zip up. <laughs> well, it was zipped so strong I couldn't get it open. <laughs> I don't know what it was. I don't care. But my, my brother, he flew back there trying to help me uh, at least pull out a little bit of the, the history. So before we get into that, um, uh, what the panel will be here and uh, what you're going to be doing, I thought I would just um, read some of the information that we did manage to glean out of, um, out of that file. Um, this is a little bit later than 1968. This particular article um, happened in April 1972, and it was a Buff report, the Grass uh, report about what was happening at the time. They called it a progress uh, summary. And the chair of the board, so some of you will recognize some of the names at the time, was Carl Lyle Warner. Anybody remember that name? Anybody in the room? Put your hand up, so don't be afraid. So, what? Yes, Dr. Milton back there. Some of you remember the name. And he, talk, he said in that article, the goal of the Black United Front was not just to alleviate suffering or change conditions, but to create the situation in which the democratic process and system can work in the black community and the black community can participate fully and receive the necessary government services, programs, and set, et cetera. So this would equal community development and human resource development and not the traditional social welfare and social development. Jules Oliver, the executive director, reported that this negates the traditional philosophy. It removes the rats, rape, roaches, and lack of recreation, which is what is usually talked about. They talked about, um, in this new particular uh, report, that what was happening with the youth. And the first uh, black youth committee being formed, that was in 1971. They formed Buff Enterprises and discussions, discussions to implement training programs, human resource development. There was programs, some of you will remember, the Local Initiative Program, LIP, and OFY, Opportunities for Youth. And the goal being to build community recreation centers, community beautification, jobs, health projects that re relate to mental, mental health, education, minority awareness program, black history series, uh, grain commit commission briefs, and housing surveys. They noted that at the 117th session of the African United Baptist Association that a resolution was established at that um, uh, meeting of the African Baptist Association. And it said that the Black United Front recognizes the spiritual contribution of the AUBA 
and the AUBA acknowledges the Black United Front organization to be a valued instrument through which many of the historical aims can be achieved. And it was signed by Reverend D.D. D. Scare as the clerk and Reverend D.E. Uh, Fairfax because they felt that the role of the church was also social activism, which they weren't participating um, when which they weren't uh, partic participating in. The paper drew attention to the fact that was, there was a lot of dissension between the Black United Front and the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission. And uh, Jules, it says Jules Oliver and Marvin Schiff, who was the, uh, the who was white and chair of the first uh, commission. Lots of people are, I, I, I can remember well what happened there. And that there were many battles that being, uh, being waged. And they attributed the first win to Marvin at the Human Rights uh, uh, Commission because they felt that the Black United Front didn't have their facts together, but they certainly won after uh, being declared non-winner in the first, uh, first instance. So I just um, raised, I think there's a, another one here too, just quickly, that, um, that you should uh, have, have in terms of what, uh, what was happening at the time. No, I think I'll do that as we go along. But what I will say is that, so that you're really clear, is that I personally was not at the founding meeting of the Black United Front here in this room in 1978. I was actually a 16-year-old uh, student in Toronto, Nova Scotia, so do the math. And, um, but I felt like I was here because it was very, um, very much in the forefront of uh, the talk about the community. That particular meeting, I read in the papers as I went along, was considered to be the first all black, this is what the paper said, remember that. <coughs> My mother would say, I'm only relaying to you what I bought fresh this morning. <laughs> They had declared it to be an all, first all-black meeting in Canada. Uh, the press, all press was barred. Um, all the participants were asked to tell, not to tell reporters anything. At the time, there were 14,000 what they called Negroes in Nova Scotia. And that the committee that was established, they called the ruling of eight militants that would rule the, the, the committee of the day. So I thought, and you guys, you just wait, we're getting to you, but I wanted to give actually the audience a quick chant, a quick, spell quick, Q, Q U I C K, quick chance to do a little bit of a roll call, right? Because you are not going out this door tonight and say, well, you didn't mention such and such, and you didn't say anything about such and such, and they were there. So we're going to have a little bit of a quick roll call. So this is where you get an opportunity to stand up and say the name of a person who was active and critical in your mind, and it doesn't have to be one of these big eight leaders that you're talking about, because we know that often the reason they're the big wigs up at the top is because of the little ones down at the bottom, right? So I want you to take an opportunity, think for one second, and just stand up and say a name of a person that you felt at that time who might have been involved and did something that you think is worthy of calling their name, okay? So take your quick second, think, for those that were around them. Okay, we're gonna start at the back, is it, I can't see, is it Mr. Smith? Go ahead, just call your names. Okay, what's your name again? Richard King, wonderful. 
Another name. Buddy Day. Stand up and say it. Stand up. We can't. We can't hear who they stand. Buddy Day. Next. Buddy Day for sure. Katie Fels. Reverend P. A. Best and Ada Fels. Reverend P. A. Best and Ada Fels from down Yarmouth way. Some other names. Come on now. Gus Wetterberg. Mm. And I was at the meeting. Well, there you go. <laughs> Gus Wetterberg in Shelly fashion. And you were on the bus. I was on the bus. <laughs> Very good. No. Some other names. Anybody else was at the meeting? Yes, yeah, stand up to you at the meeting. Yeah. Anybody at the meeting? Besides Shelly? <laughs> okay. I got so many emails from people who were at the meeting saying they were going to come, right? Uh, <laughs> okay, is that it? Don't want to overdo it. <laughs> Okay, so um, at this time, um, there's many of you that will also, you'll have some questions, but you'll also have stories that came out out of what happened with the Black United Front. And since many of you weren't there, I can't even imagine telling you what the spirit in the community was at that time. It was electric. And for once, it was scary, it was electric, but at the same time, it was scary. Because here we were as a black community talking about the real black power. And that had almost been unheard of, especially in Nova Scotia. And because there were a lot of young people involved, a lot of the older people weren't ready for it. So we were even fighting against the authority of our parents in, adopting what was happening um, uh, at that time. Also, for many of us were facing a more overt racism and discrimination and also the systemic, but in doing that, we thought that the Black United Front was the savior, to be the savior of all saviors. They were gonna, all we had to do was if someone picked on us or something happened, we, we just stretched them and said, well, guess what? We're going to bring in the Black United Front. <laughs> Everybody was touting the name of the Black United Front because that's what they were going to do at that particular, at that particular time. We had committees formed um, all over shortly. There were youth committees. There were uh, committees by community, like Troll had... Um, uh, developed a group out of the Black United Front, and Glasgow had a group, Yarmouth had a group. We all had a group that was attached to the Black United Front to work on the issues that were affecting the community, and that was to feed into the, um, the larger group. So there was great hope. There was really great hope. But as we develop, let's, let's, let's find out what happened along the way, and you're going to help us um, fill in some of those gaps, right? So I'll let the, um, Susie's the only one that hasn't uh, been on, uh, we haven't heard her voice. So we'll just get her to tell us um, some of her background and then you'll be able to ask her questions too as we go along. If you'd like to. Um, my name is Susie Hansen and I was an elected board member at the Halifax Regional School Board at the time. Now it's HRRC or whatever it is, Education um, Center. Um, I am also appointed as a Provincial Advisory Council on Education uh, for this coming year and for the next year as well. Um, my background is I'm a performer, but I'm a mother first. So I have six children, and all six children right now are in the education system, so I felt that that was my push to, to make a difference and to kind of speak up for those families and my own family um, in the education system. Um, I also work with youth. I'm, I'm an employee of the Phoenix Youth Programs, and I work with youth that are um, within my community of Mulgrave Park, but as well um, youth that may be in crisis, youth that may need that extra support. So um, I have a, a wide range of, of skills that I utilize on a daily basis, but um, overall, um, I'm about the youth and the children in my community. 
and Alvin Jr. Thank you very much to you. I want to add more of your social activism background now. You're okay? No, I'm good. I actually wanted to ask people questions more than I wanted. Okay, so we'll give you an opportunity to do that. So, to start with, um, uh, Isaac left us with a challenge in his um, paper which said, what should the relationship between the African Nova Scotian and the community and the state be? What should the relationship between the African Nova Scotian community and the state be? So I throw that out as a discussion um, question. You may have some thoughts about that or just any questions or, or um, insights that you have regarding um, the period starting from the 60s right on through. Some of you are too young to have been born in the 60s, but that doesn't mean you, have, you don't have questions about what happened then or how things uh, are for you today. Does it have something to do with what happened then, what's happening today? So, who would like to start off the questioning? And I'm not calling you old, just the older <laughs> comrades in the room. Um, I guess a question I always want to know is, like, because part of what yes, happens, yes. part of what happens is that um, we fight these struggles over and over again, and it's like we're reinventing the wheel when it's already existing. Um, so you know, we have like Black Lives Matter and stuff, and then people are doing the same things and making the same mistakes that people made 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago. So from people who have been in the community fighting these battles for those 30 or 50 or 10 or whatever years it is, I guess that's something I'm really interested in. Is like, where do you feel that we've gone wrong to this point and what lessons can we carry forward? So, um, you know, wh what goals did we have that we haven't seen? Do we have insight into why that didn't happen? What did we do wrong? Were they unrealistic goals? Did we just not fight from the right ways? And what lessons can we carry forward as we fight battles against um, we're still fighting battles in our schools. I mean, Kenny Fells, you're fighting those battles too. You know, we have some historians in the room. Um, obviously, people just on the streets in their communities. You know, like we're still fighting the police. We're still fighting gentrification in our communities. We're still fighting prisons. We're fighting all these things that we were fighting 50 years ago and 200 years ago, right? Um, so I was hoping that some of our older, uh, not old, elders, our wisers in the room might just speak from the heart about some of that insight. That's what I was hoping for. Before people ask, I would like to say that one of the things that I received was a lot of communications yeah, from people who had been involved in early years. And one of the things was very interesting was at the end of this year, year um, like, I had a lot of conversations with Rocky over the last two or three years of his life. And one of the things he was trying to do was not recreate work, but recreate an independent black political organization. So his conception of Africa Nova Scotian self-determination was about independence, independent black politics. Mm -hmm. That didn't necessarily mean you could not accept state funding, but had to be state funding that had no strings attached, okay? And in the sense that state funding that would not end up controlling the organizations, right? So one of the decisions that was actually made at the Black United Front, according to some description, at, at what was one of the decisions that was made at the historic black family meeting was that any organization that came down, came out of the, that meeting would not accept government funding. Right? And what happened is some people, because people have different conceptions, right? Some people believed, like Rocky, that you needed a militant revolutionary approach to solve these issues. Others believed that you needed to cajole, to persuade behind the scenes the state, and therefore you needed to take advantage of the state resources, right? I mean, I stand on Rocky's side, but that's another issue. And I think this is one of the things to talk about. Do we need an independent black political organization? Because whatever the critics we had of Buff, when Buff disappeared, we missed having a provincial black organization that take make black interest. Okay, I don't want to yeah, I'm sorry, sorry. I don't want to lose Al's question yeah. in um, in that because I'll take yours as the second question that you're asking, oh, it's related to who? asking it's related to the uh, audience. Yeah. But um, I think with Al it was um, uh, about the, the the organizations from before and reinventing the wheel. So did someone have their hand up to do a response? No, but I'll, I'll, I'll Thank you. Uh, one of the things that I uh, sort of noticed about most of the organizations that I had not to deal with or work with or uh, even become 
involved with <coughs> from the 70s up until now. Um, I mean, there's a, there, there, there are many who would take political analysis and try to take this to a debate that's uh, at, a, at, a, at a level of um, academia. But the reality of it is that every organization that I know of that that, that it formed, formed to try and make a difference in the lives of black people. And most of them as well did it without having training. They didn't have community development training, they didn't have social uh, organizing skills, they didn't have a, a whole lot of the things that many of the white groups, and even those that, uh, uh, those leaders like Rocky, before Rocky came to Nova Scotia, he was trained. Black people here weren't trained. Black people here had the interest of black people at heart as much as Rocky did. But it was those people who were, they had the responsibility of trying to impact the direct change in their own communities. What ultimately happens is that even with the organizations that we have now, the same people stay involved. We don't have a succession plan in which we can retrain or get uh, younger people involved or get them in and get them equipped with the tools and the interest to take on the tasks that these organizations are, 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 are left with. And I think that's a key thing that happened with the, the Black United Front. Um, although in the 70s, there became more trained black people um, that uh, didn't have the training. That, that some, like there were some initiatives like uh, uh, Canada World Youth and, and uh, some of those others that, that, were, that were providing some type of uh, training. There was also a lot more people who had formal education and formal training through universities that started to get through high school. Because when I came uh, to high school, like there were like 60 or 70 of us that walked across the commons on that first day. Well, by Christmas time, there were six or seven of us that walked across the commons. People weren't getting through school. That many weren't getting through school. That many weren't graduating, and therefore you didn't even think about university, it just wasn't in the picture because those, most of those that did stay in high school only ended up with uh, general education and didn't qualify to get to the, the, the university. But it, it, there's, a, there's a, a, a gap between, well, first off, the gap was between those who were formally educated and those who were uh, skills educated, like Rocky and those, and the black community leadership that didn't have much. I'm Jake, I, I'm, I put Rocky and WP, Jules Oliver, some of those guys, university educated and social, socially and, and, and uh, politically trained. Most of the other leaders that I know of didn't have that. So there's a gap there. All of those leaders had the responsibility of, 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 of managing and running those organizations. And then there was a gap between what they had and the next generations that were coming. While their task was to encourage, and, and, and they did a really good job of this, as many people as possible to stay in school, get an education, and get on with, with, with uh, um, get, get, becoming educated. Um, but they didn't have the opportunity to pick up the organizing training and working in the community. Thank you for starting us off, Gilbert. I was really appreciative. And I'll see if one of our panelists uh, can respond to that. Well, I, I just want to say thanks, Mr. Day. Um, I, I, I as well understand that that gap is still there um, because I'm, I'm shaking my head and I'm not, and I'm like, I remember that and I was in high school, what, 30 years ago? So, or 25 years ago, sorry. Um, and that was the <laughs> 15. Anyways. <laughs> But that's the same. That was the same process, and and that gap hasn't changed. And I think that's the that that's the struggle that um, what, when I was a part of the board, those were the same types of gaps that we were seeing with our youth now. And those are things that I think under underlying is a systemic piece where you know um, 
we, we really want it to be fixed, and I think those are the things that we need to advocate for, and, and, and those are things that everybody has been advocating for, but right, it's that it's that same cycle of like, well, what, what was happening 30 years ago or 40 years ago is still happening. So like, how do we, how do we change that? How do we, um, uh, you know, build ourselves up to be able to tackle that in a sense as, as, a, as a whole, as, as black families and black communities? Thank you. I have Kenny and then uh, Shelly. Kenny, me? <laughs> Sorry. Is that your name? Here. Oh. <laughs> anyway, um, I wanted to answer Al's question because I think it's relative that, uh, you know. I just wanted to uh, expand on Al's question because I think that Gilly did a good job, but on the other hand, there needs to be some contextualized history because we have to remember G.I. Smith, the premier at that time, wanted to have black teachers in all the schools, and of course, he didn't get black teachers, he went to the Southeast Asian continent and brought the black teachers over here. So that's the start of how the challenges started for us as individuals of black, of African ancestry. And for those, remember the incentive fund, which is what it's called now, the Negro Fund, that came out of that. But the Black United Front was a key organization and was a highly revolutionary organization. It doesn't matter how you depicted. I think of people as names like Francis Mills, Francis Clements Mills, and many of the black people who came across the province, um, just like everybody else, to, to foster that black community. But each time those things happen, the government always played a role in, uh, once they developed something, once we developed the program, whether it was uh, the Black United Front coming up with the the basketball tournament, the softball tournament, things which were, but the, at that time were called something different than where they were, they became. I think it's significant to know that the government always put challenges and barriers in our way that stopped that from happening. And many of us in the room know that we were the first to graduate from high school ourselves. So the education piece that Gilbert talked about is relevant. So one of the things I ask is all those folks who are TYP graduates, stand up. It's me and you. So I think, I think, well, it's ironic that the group that just stood up, we were all that class. So me, Sharna, Charla, Gilbert. Yeah, and I didn't forget you. You forgot my name. <laughs> so if you think about those four people, we all grew up with Rocky Jones and Fred Ward. Two people that you talked about that were in that original organization. And the things that we went through in our own organization is developing our own music programs. That all came from the ideas and suggestions from Rocky and Fred. And that continued on because that revolutionary peace still is there for us. But to, to continue with Al's question, not to keep going on about it, the government has always found a way to, to put a challenge in our way. Given us the board, uh, the Black Report come up, then the Black Report was shelved. 44 recommendations, 12 of them have been implemented. So now all the entities that came out of the Black Report are all separate entities that work for the government. So working for the government, the funding will be cut or you follow the key. So the challenges are always the same. So our folks, our men, our women who are incarcerated, we need to continue to develop those programs to foster an opportunity for them to come back. We need to build capacity in our community, something that we've always tried. But just like Isaac was saying, we still need that organization that represents us, that has the fear that the Black United Front had in the 70s with all those individuals. Delmore Buddy Day, um, George McCurdy, all those folks. W.P. Oliver, 
they were all critical. They all massed together, but they all came together. When they left the meeting, they were all together. That doesn't happen today. Okay. Thank you, uh, Kim. Um, we have Shelly. Can you come? Hello. Sorry, Gilbert, that we didn't give you a light before. We were just late. Yeah, I just wanted to say I was um, back then. I was one of those ones. I, I did graduate. It was five of us, myself, Connie Sparks, Theodore Bundy, and two others that all graduated from Ray Crate in 1971, all the black um, and the students. But uh, I think back then there was such a strong sense of unity we knew who the enemy was, and that was the system, and uh, those that perpetuated racism and systemic racism. And so it was a clear thing. It was something that we often discussed. Now, the young people today, I do not hear them talk often about a political consciousness, a critical consciousness. And it's like things have been so watered down that they think, they think everything is okay. They don't, you know, and only because they don't take the time to discuss and dialogue and see what it really is about. And they're really not much better off than what we were. And often I have to defend my blackness with young people. It's like, wait a minute. Why would you want this white person to do this job? You know, it's like, no, we can find those people in our own community. And these are the ones that we have to build and learn and mentor, you know. So I think that's one of the things. I don't find that that political dialogue or discussion or thing happen. We definitely need a political arm. We really do. We do not have a voice. I see what happened, what's happening with the, um, you know, the Acadian um, electoral district. Now they came out in a strong, unified voice. And that's what we need to start building. It, it's possible because it happened back then. I was there, I remember that meeting. It was the white people, and no disrespect, they were shaking in their boots. There was so much fear of, of these Black Panthers. They were really just coming and giving a message of pro-blackness and equality. And, uh, you know, Halifax had never seen anything like it. And uh, to be honest with you, we, we, we were just bathing in it. We just loved it. Because for a minute, we felt really good about who we were. And um, so I guess that's all I want to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, oh, just for oh, I'm now trying to pressure Shauna to say something. It's not your own. She'll say. Grab the mic. Yeah, I know. I'm confused, so. I just kind of, yeah, man up. Uh, my name's Tende. I'm a member of 902 Man Up. Um, I kind of want to say that the youth are listening. The youth are having these conversations. With all due respect to my elders, I think the issue is there's a huge disconnect because, if I can just be so frank to say it, the older generation didn't do much for us. You guys didn't build any institutions for us. When you look at other, other nations, other races, I'm from Toronto, when you go there, the East Indian community, their parents build something. The Jewish community, the Italian community, the Portuguese community, they all built something. We never got anything. What you guys did for us was social, but nothing economic. So when you when you when you talk about these issues and these kids are around and they're talking, that's fine that you know they're able to go downtown now, which they really can't, 
but they find they can hopefully get into a cab or whatever, but there's no institutions here. When you look at all of the buildings that are going around here, they're refusing to hire black employees. How do I know this? Because I'm in those meetings with the government and they're telling me we are not going to hire your children. Where were you guys? You failed us. And I think the only way that you're going to understand the youth is if you really look in the mirror and say we failed. And when you do that, you will leave us alone. Because I keep saying it every single day. Let the youth run with the ball. What worse can they do? Give them the car keys. If they smash the car, they smash the car. But then you gave us a jalopy. Anyways. So, I'm going to say this, and I, and I know some of my elders may not like this, but you need to let it go. You have to let it go and let the youth run the cut. Because the elders, and I'm, I'm half Nigerian, so if you have any idea how we treat our elders, for me to say this, it might, even if my father heard me say this, he'd be upset. But I have to have this conversation with all of my elders. Because the elders are only there for one reason. For guidance and counsel. That's it. They are not there for leadership. And you guys, the elder generation, did not teach us how to lead. We're teaching ourselves how to lead. Just leave us alone now. I'm being real. I'm speaking from a street level, I'm speaking from an academic level. Leave us alone. If we come to you and ask for your counsel, then you give it to us and you walk away. Thank you. That was great, I love it. We started out about uh, Al's poem talking about the revolution, and she said the revolution is right here in the room. Is it in this room? Yes, Give so it a hand or a round of applause. The revolution is in the room. The revolution is in the room. Um, I have a couple of a couple of hands. Um, I I wanted to um, uh, back up just. A little bit, if I may, before you go there, and just tell you what the youth, um, what happened with the youth, uh, with the building of the Black United Front. In um, many ways, it was the youth who uh, participated in actually bringing about the end of the Black United Front. Because in the beginning, uh, the youth were very active. Remember I talked about in the newspaper articles, building committees and different things <coughs> happening in the community. Well, I think the youth um, in that day were saying the same kinds of things in a way that Tunde is saying today is that you're not representing us. The Black United Front uh, is no longer um, uh, representing the youth interest. And as a result, um, uh, in a, a conference, I was there, um, it, that took place, a provincial conference that the Black United Front organized for the youth, and the youth did really the background organization. Well, the youth decided, in their wisdom, to have their own secret agenda. And in that secret agenda, the youth wanted to bring down the Black United Front, and to stop the funding from um, uh, all the government funding we felt in the black community was going into that one organization and we weren't seeing the results of it. So as a result, we uh, held a sit in, <laughs> in the Black United Front uh, offices. And I personally, I remember it like it was yesterday. The reason, a lot for me, Kenny, how many were there at the sit-in? Let's just do a hand for that. So there's a few in the room that were at the sit-in. And the reason it's so important to me, I wish to they hadn't left the room, was because um, I am um, bringing up, with respect for my elders, uh, particularly my parents, <laughs> um, I uh, had come up to Halifax from Truro for that youth conference, but I felt very strongly with the other youth that we needed to take a stand and uh, condemn what was happening with the Black United Front. And so um, I was part of that sit-in. Now, I was supposed to go immediately back home to Truro with my parents. <laughs> but I decided that, um, no, this meant too much to me. I had to take a stand. 
I, it was so important. To me, it was like life and death. And it's kind of, for any of you that know the Bible, and it's Esther, again, my favorite, is if I perish, I perish, but I'm staying. And I can still remember my parents coming up from Truro and knocking on the window of the Black United Front, which we had all locked up so nobody else could get in. And them telling me to come home, get out of there, get out of there, and I'm like, no, no. <laughs> so the youth, um, it, it's not much dif difference in terms of what the youth impression of uh, what their elders is and what they're doing and uh, what they're not doing. And we do really need to all listen to each other and have those conversations about how we can work together to, for a common agenda. So, I have other Yeah, I just had a question. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay, so I just had a question sort of to the tune of what Tunde was talking about. Has there ever been an attempt um, in the history since this meeting of the black community trying to reclaim physical space and workplaces and run them in a way that challenges capitalist property rights, right? So I feel like I've, what the work that's been going on during this time, since this time, is political advocacy work, and that work is important, but it is without like a material base of like autonomy that you can self-determine, it lends itself almost immediately to co-optation. And that's where we're at today, I feel like. So yeah. I wonder well, Yeah, there's a lot of um, that question. I forget your name. Uh, thank you. No, and no offense to the social workers in the room, but um, one of the arguments has been that we've all been turned into social workers and not politics, so that our energies have been put from building political parties and building political spaces into hands-on work, which is important, right? But, and that's why that work is so consuming, because when you look and you see there's somebody in this community or in this prison or in the street in the school, and they need my immediate help. So we spend a lot of energy giving that immediate help, spending that time on the phone, getting that resources to that person. But that doesn't leave us a lot of energy to say, well, how do we get rid of the prison? Or how do we change the school? Or how do we um, you know, build this thing in our community? Um, so that we spend a lot, and some people have argued, I'm not the first person to argue this, um, Ajamu Nangwaya has argued this, right? That um, our energies are very strategically by the government put into this, right? So that this is a, a deliberate strategy that we spend a lot of time on that direct work and no time on building political parties, building political spaces, and then that's why it's not sustainable. That's why from generation to generation, we have to come back to the same place because we never have anything. So it's not a lack of effort or a lack of commitment or a lack of love for the community. It's not that you know the person, the generation before us is like, yeah, I don't really care. It's that that labor is pouring out of you and pouring out of you and pouring out of you, but because it's not in another place, there's nothing there. I was gonna say to me, I think, um, it's not for the people that are in the generation above me or whatever. Um, I think we also have to learn to, when to strategically reach out. And I think um, it's not, oh, I, I would disagree with Tunde on like, say what you want to leave us alone. I think there's also um, when we can use people that say within the system who have gotten that position. So an example I would cite was with Abdul Abdi. Um, there were points where I was calling up like Robert Wright and I'm like, I need you to do this part. Like you're the one that needs to go and speak to DCS because you know that system. And when they're going to call you, because we're complaining about DCS, they're not going to call me, but they're going to call you. So this is what my agenda is here, and you're going to carry that out. So the, the people that are at the tables aren't separate from that. We have to have that communication to say, okay, so like when someone comes to you, because, and Robert always talks about this, like there's the field Negroes and then the ones, and he's like, but then you can be a field Negro on the inside. But to do that, because like, when the Negroes are being loud in the streets, they come to certain people and like, you know, those people are causing trouble. You seem like a nice one, you know? And so you're like, it's really important then to know what the goal is and to work for that from both positions, right? So to have that communication, I think we have sometimes done that successfully and sometimes it doesn't because we're not talking. There's times where I've written something or done something and didn't talk to the person. I'm like, oh, I didn't realize that was your agenda. Oops, you know? I didn't mean outside of you, you should have told me. Um, so I think intergenerational communication is really, really important, right? And having that communication with each other. Um, and not, so it's not just, oh, you know, you're, you're now with the system, we can be, but it's how we're with the system. Mm. 
It's if we're there, how are we reaching back? How are we speaking around those tables? And are we like taking that position to block people out and to gatekeep? Or are we using it in strategic ways? And it's always a strategy. We have to outthink. Uh, when we were doing Abdul, what they said is that we were successful because we, like this, this was set on Parliament Hill by people who were scared. Shit, that's of us. They were terrified of us because we were working 24-7 and we worked across the country and we worked together. And they said, they're a machine and you can't, they're, they're, here, they're out here. They're out here. So we can do that. So, yes. Thank you, Lel, because I want to make sure Isaac gets in on yeah. that same well, question. Well, you read a very important point and you use the question of capitalist property relations. And I think uh, when we look at uh, the Black Liberation with the Black Panther Party, we look at the circuits that Rocky was going through at that time, they spoke about socialism. And he spoke about building uh, uh, black liberation around socialism as opposed to capitalism. And I think what often happens is we've reduced uh, uh, you know, black advancement to being entrepreneurs, for example. I'm, I'm not saying that small private business is bad or what have you. But what ends up happening is, you know, if you buy into the capitalist idea, and capitalism, I would argue, is destroying the planet. Capitalism, you know, we can look at the ecological crisis, we can look at the, I mean, as Phil Castro you say, they talk about the failure of socialism, but where's the success of capitalism in Asia, Africa, and Latin America? Well, we can ask those questions, right? So I think this is a fundamental issue. And the question, can capitalism serve any oppressed people? And capitalism itself sets up competition between people. They're always winners and losers. I mean, that's the nature of capitalism. That doesn't mean people deliberately set out to disenfranchise, to dispossess people, though some do. I mean, I think of Trump, but we leave that aside. But the issue is that basically it's not a system that pr promotes collectivity, it's not a system that pr pr promotes collective well being. And I think this is one of the things we have to actually think about very carefully as well. Um, because at the end of the day, if all we want is a piece of the pie, and the pie is poisoned, well, then we're going to end up in an extremely uh, toxic situation. Thank you very much. We have my sister. What's your name, please? My name is Eunice. Eunice and then Ifo. And then Mark. I need a microphone. Come on and get it. Thank you, Eunice. I want to thank you, everyone who is here. And I want to mention something that made me come all the way for this meeting. First, I'm a teacher before I'm a policy analyst. I was a school teacher in this community and I never understood what was happening. I was at St. Pat's High. I had an experience that I never felt supported by my elders. Um, and as a result, I walked out of the classroom where I was making over $25 per hour to go to a call center to just put food on the table. I tell that story because of the narratives I have had here and to your question where you were saying, would it be having the independent funds to work or otherwise, I would, I would say the only way that can work unless you actually create a system where the people of African descent feel as a unity, then it won't work. And the only way we can do that is first to be aware of who we are and come up with whatever terminology. If we say black is black, there's nothing like black and African and some other thing. That is the only way you can actually uh, revive the energies that happened here in 1968. As you were giving the story, you mentioned about the Kikuyu and the Mau Mau in Kenya. They, they never had any school, not even grade one, some of the Mau Mau fighters. But they were able to actually unite and fight the colonialism and the imperialism. So until we actually be aware, and I agree, I see something saying, fail big there. So if we actually agree that we failed big and become, accept that, it hasn't worked, and now we need to find a way to move forward to make the change. That we need a total mindset change to actually see ourselves as a unit in order to do that. Otherwise, I propose a different option in terms of how do we move forward. There is discussion about deliberative collaboration where you work with the people. So. 
it's an approach where if you want to bring change, you work with the people who have the power, whether it's policy makers or politicians, to have the negotiation and say what change we want. Mm -hmm. I agree with you when you say that the system is structured in a way that we are put in a place. I've been in a meeting where someone is actually telling me, I wanted to put you in your place. Oh, oh. I say, oh, oh. really? I didn't understand what that statement meant, but I'm trying to learn because when I left the classroom, I was teaching at St. Pat's High. And the experience I had from the black youth, I had two classes, I've told this story before somewhere else. I had two classes, grade 12, I had 27 students, and three of them were white. Grade 11, I had 30 students, and three of them were non white. How those dynamics worked, I never knew, but I had a really bad experience, and the white students in the grade 12 stood up for me and reported to the vice to the principal what was happening in class. <clears throat> and in my struggle of understanding what exactly happened, someone told me it's called internalized racism. So as I speak right now, I know there are cases where I say I'm black and I'm told, no, you're not black, you're African. Until we actually come up with a common terminology, then this is not gonna work. So thank you. Thank you. People, um, Mark, and then we'll look at how we're going to close off if there's a final question or whatever. Um, and then, uh, thank you. My name is Ifo. I am Isoko from the Niger Delta region. The British decided to call the land Nigeria without asking us, so I don't recognize it. Um, it's like my sister read my mind. Fundamentally, we're dealing with a situation of identity. They have stolen our identity, and then they're trying to replace it with something that doesn't work. Um, as someone who grew up in Africa, I can tell you that we've had multiple decades of trying to get capitalism to work for us. And that shit hasn't worked. <laughs> so the, set, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different same result. Right. So, um, so I think that there is, there's a degree of disrespect for African wisdom that is coming from Africans. We hear people quote Africans that they've read in books, but when we're actually here talking to you, we don't get much respect. We, get, we don't get respect for white people, we also don't get respect from African Nova Scotians about black wisdom. No, they want us to drum and dance, which I do. But when we're actually talking about wisdom, there is a dif fundamental disrespect. So there's a famous question that is said, who taught you to hate yourself? And I think we need to ask ourselves that question, because the thing about Sankofa going back and bring it forward, so you ask the question about the relationship. I look at it as an abusive relationship. I look at Canada being like an abusive partner in relationship with black people. Actually, Canada's an abusive partner to everybody, but especially black and brown people. If you buy into the idea that this your abusive boyfriend or girlfriend is the best thing for you, then you are lost. So I think if we're trying to figure out how Canada can work, we've lost our damn minds. Because Canada is designed to kill us. Mm -hmm. So what we should be figuring out is independence, self-determination as indigenous peoples, self-determination in coordination with the indigenous people whose land is currently stolen. Um, because if we, we need to learn to love ourselves. We need to fundamentally love ourselves. We need to ask ourselves these questions. And I think there's a lot of divisions. Um, I don't think that it's necessarily a problem. I don't think we have to agree on everything. But when white people are trying to destroy us, they don't agree on everything. Whether they're liberals, conservatives, greed, it doesn't matter. They're still going to screw us over. So maybe we should come up with a strategy where we will decide that even if we don't like each other, we will make sure that we don't get screwed over. And I think if we learn those, those techniques, which the Mao Mao will learn, and to, to follow up on that, I think the education system is also part of the problem because you cannot destroy the master's house with the master's tools. So I think we need to stop sending our kids to white schools. We need to send them to Afrocentric schools that we yeah. so actually know who they are. Thank you. Have we responded on the No. I just want to say I, I agree. We need an Afrocentric school, and I think that's really important. Thank you, Mr. Faust.
Um, but as well, that comes to uniting in, in a way to, to come to an agreement on what that's going to look like and how we want it to, you know, educate our children. So. Everybody else has their own school. That's right. Thank you. Hello. 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 Sorry about my voice, I've had an operation on my vocal cord. But I just wanted to address your question with regard to uh, our attitude towards uh, uh, finances. I was on the final board of directors of the Black United Front. My first job on the Black United Front was to make peace with Rocky Jones. And we brought Rocky in, and Rocky came in and accepted it from us and became an advisor to our council. <clears throat> um, we began to stop paying rent with the resources that we were given and take the same resources to start to purchase property. We purchased the property up on Billy Street. The black educators bought the collar down here on Goggin Street. The government said, hell no! and cut our funding off. Okay? So my people said, our nation is a nation designed to fear the black man's face. They cannot stand to see a group of black men get together and start to move in a powerful way. Yeah, well, I know. <laughs> I can't speak for women. hard to work on your liberation when you don't have housing. And part of, of, of ha getting that liberation is getting meaningful employment and meaningful jobs. And I don't know how many forums that we have to keep coming to in raising the issue of the fact that consistently our community tells us that their number one area of concern, forget about health, Forget about housing, all these other issues, they consistently, number one comes out is, we want meaningful employment. We want a job so we can provide for our families within our community and do all those things ourselves. And I keep raising the point that in the African Nova School, in our community, in this community, there is not one organization not one whose primary, primary concern is to find employment for black people. None. None. Anybody wants to dispute it, go ahead. But there's none. That's number one that we continue to raise. Gilbert raised many good points about um, who, who, who needs to do the kind of work and get to the issues that are in our community. Well, he would well know the work of his father in the neighborhood center. I consistently say, we don't need the PhDs to do this particular work, or the BEDs, or, or the social workers, and all this. We need people out on the streets who know our community, can get into our community's homes, talk to them, find out what their concerns are, and help to advocate on their, back, on their, on their part. We don't have, we don't have those field street workers 
to who are doing that same old fashioned kind of work that worked. Like the old folks did. It worked. We don't ever, we don't ever raise those issues or take the money when we get at our organizations and things to do that uh, work. My third and final is because we've been neglected for all these things that we've talked about tonight, and we have had none of these uh, issues, they just keep repeating, as Al said, are we reinventing the world? Real? We're due reparations. And if you have any organization, any area, anything you're working on, and it's not one person or one organization who has that responsibility. If you don't have reparations on your agenda with what you're doing, then you really haven't touched the concerns and issues that are taking place within our community. So I'll turn it back to, uh, to our uh, illustrious chair. Uh, here, and I'll get off the stage. <laughs> well, I think, you know, all good things must come to end at some point. Though, I know the original meeting that took place on November 30th, 1916, and other black family meetings that are taking place, for example, the one um, that after the 91 um, right, uh, so-called race riot, I call it the rebellion, <laughs> that took place here in 91. People remember the Rodney King, 1992 one. But there was one that took place here in Halifax, that after police brutality, that actually made the international news and led to a huge uh, black family meeting. Of course, the energy that happened there in that meeting got uh, diffused into basically, as Ellis pointed out, diverting energies into the, shall we say, the dead-end cul-de-sac corridors that the state normally diverts the energies of oppressed people into, and you have to take that into consideration. There's also the one that happened um, in 1989 after the Cold Harbor incident that led to the formation of Black, um, Black Women's Advisory Committee. So all of these things um, have happened, and, unf and unfortunately those meetings went on for very long periods of time, because on one level they were about, uh, in a sense, trying to plan to look at what the problems were and trying to get the communities out of the problems. And I participated in several of them. And on another time, quite often, because we face, uh, shall we say, so many egregious acts of racism and denial of our humanity, that quite often people sometimes just need a forum to vent, to get it off their chest. It's a healthy psychological thing. So it's been a pleasure having um, you guys coming out to this event. Uh, the whole point about marking it was not just simply to mark it as a very important chronological marker in African Nova Scotian history, but it, uh, and also in the black global, global black liberation movement, but also to look at the problems we're confronting. The United, Na the United Nations uh, report on the conditions of African Nova Scotians is deplorable. I mean, in terms of the conditions it's located. If you actually read the, the, the um, United Nations uh, Human Rights Council debate on the report, the more scathing remarks are made about, about Canadians, about, about Canada itself. And it's important to understand we're in the midst of the international decade for people of African descent. How long did it take the province, how long did it take the federal government to acknowledge there was an international decade? And they still have not acknowledged the importance of this report. Now the report isn't saying anything new. The report isn't saying, isn't saying anything we don't know about. But the fact it comes from the United Nations gives it some significant weight, and yet the government has refused to acknowledge it. Now, on December 10th, there's going to, there's a, it's an important date, mark it in your calendars if you can. The Lord Dalhousie report is going to be re, uh, released, at least the recommendations. The Lord Dalhousie report was uh, commissioned in 2016 <laughs> after the formation of the Black uh, Faculty and Staff Caucus at Dalhousie. And we've looked into Lord Dalhousie and Dalhousie University's connection to the slave trade and other forms of systemic uh, racism. I like to refer to the transatlantic slave trade as more the like transatlantic system. And one of the issues that's addressed in it is reparations. So I think um, people would find that extremely interesting as well. <coughs> and so in, um, the discussions that have been raised here, I know we haven't solved any problems, but at least we have marked this 50th anniversary. We understand the energy, the desire for African Nova Scotian self-determination. 
as a nation, and one of the issues I always like to, to make the point, is I think a very strong case can be made, and I, I mean it, that African Nova Scotians constitute a distinct people, a quasi-nation if you want, and this has to be recognized because what comes with that is not just human rights, but collective rights. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to advance that argument. Yes. So thank you all for coming out. Thank you all for participating. What time, I see, is, uh, what time is the Dalhousie thing? I, I, don't, I don't remember. <coughs> December 10th is the day set for it. Uh, 10th for, um, it was uh, it's the same. There's also this anti-racist uh, thing that's in town. Yeah, the anti-racist thing that's on town. Is it, what time is it? 3 to 6. 3 to 6. So the December 10th, we have the time. Um, yeah. One second. One second. Yeah. So part of it is to have the report um, released, or at least the recommendations released. It's at 7 p.m. 7 p.m. And where is it again? Um, Do I have to give the location as yet? I can't remember the location. It's location. Scotiabank Auditorium. Scotiabank Auditorium in the uh, fast in the fast building, the McCain building. And one of the points about doing that is specifically uh, to have the report launched, officially launched. Uh, 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 before uh, Florizone departs, President Florizone departs from Davos University. So there's a lot of interesting initiatives. At the end of the day, the issue of unity of the African Nova Scotian community, the issue of the unity of all oppressed people um, in the struggle to transform uh, what Mumia Abu Jamal, the famous African American political prisoner, calls our dull realities, right, is still the item on the agenda. And this meeting itself you know, demonstrates that the energy, the desire, and the mission that came out of that historic November 30th, 1968 meeting still retains its energy, its relevancy, and its urgency. Yeah, and a community announcement? Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I just wanted to, to, to uh, this is a quick uh, community announcement. Um, thank Fernwood uh, Publishing for all the um, publishing that they've done um, with so many issues that affect our community that you might not be able to get published um, in other uh, publishing houses. But this is a long time away, but I can't tell you how important it is. On February the 23rd, Saturday, in this very location, our children uh, last year did a book in a day on reparations. For the first time globally, a book on reparations for children will be launched, partnered with Fernwood Publishing, here on February the 23rd. You really need to come up for the children. They wrote it, they did conceptualized it, and we're having people come in nationally and internationally to witness the first book on reparations. Wow. <laughs> And I encourage you to go to the book tables before you leave. Uh, I encourage everybody to buy Rocky Jones's autobiography, A Revolutionary. I think it's an exceptional, and it talks a lot about a black man in front of a black meeting because he played a critical role. And also, Life in the African Resistance, a collection of some of the um, poems of L. Jones. I think it's, and what we need to do as well is encourage a lot of the elders, right? Okay, the people who participate in the to write their memoirs, to tell their stories. So when I was talking to Joan Jones, uh, a few days ago and then later on today. Some of the, some of the ideas, uh, some of the concerns that people have expressed today, she expressed about the issue of making space for younger people, the issue of independent black politics. So in that spirit, um, the struggle continues, and as Stokely Carmichael used to say, when he, and he changed the name to Kwame Ture, ready for the revolution. <laughs>